why aloha mora, mother factors of muggle and witch slash wizard varieties, and welcome to 101 Facts. Yes, by the way, I know aloha mora is used to open doors and doesn't mean hello, but it just sounded nice. I'm Professor Sam Baldor, and I'm here to teach you a class about a British respectable boy legend who cast more spells and faced more three-headed dogs in his lifetime than you've had hot dinners. That is, if you've had around 50-ish hot dinners. Yes, that's right, it's Harry Potter. But why has Daniel Radcliffe been imagining Cameron Diaz in a G-string for the whole time? How did Michael Smooth Criminal Jackson try to get involved in the series? Now what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Two out of three of those questions are about to be answered, so get ready to ride a hippogriff of knowledge into the sunset while spurting off incantations of facts from the end of your cheeky little wand. This is 101 Facts About Harry Potter. Number one. The Harry Potter series was written by J.K. Rowling. By the way, quick tip, her name is pronounced J.K. Rowling, not J.K. Rowling. We've all been mispronouncing her name the whole time like silly idiots. Or at least I have. Whoopsie. Number two. With seven books, eight films, two theme parks, merchandise, and a partridge in a pear tree, the Harry Potter brand has an estimated worth of 15 billion galleons. I mean dollars, muggle dollars. Number three. Over 450 million copies of the books have been sold. However, the first print run of Sorcerer slash Philosopher slash Sorcerosopher Philosopher, whatever the hell you want to call it, Stone was a mere 1,000 copies. Whoever owns those now are probably very rich muggles. Number four. The debut book first apparated into the shelves of Flourish and Blots and Beyond in 1997, and J.K. Rowling was offered a $3,800 advance for its publication. Number five. The books have since been translated into 77 different languages, including Latin for you old school clever clogs out there. Number six. It's estimated that every 30 seconds, someone in the world begins reading the Harry Potter series. Wait for it. And now. Boom! Chapter 1! Go, go, go! Number 7! When Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban was released, publishers asked stores not to sell the book until schools were closed for the day to prevent truancy. Those bloody delinquents, dropping out of school to avoid a day of working and reading to... Um... Read... Number 8! J.K. Rowling failed to get into Oxford, the university. The city's open to anybody, I hear, and quite lovely at this time of year and instead studied French and Classics at Exeter University, which she described as frantically posh. Ooh, la dee da That's probably what she meant by that, just to let you know. Number nine. Harry Potter was turned down 22 times by publishers before being picked up. 22! Mind you, I'm sure I can beat that record on a Friday night. <sighs> Number ten. Much like a detective writing her will in an old noir movie before being shot by the mob after she double-crossed them to save the life of a dancer. Sorry, I got far too into that simile there. She completed the first draft of The Philosopher's Stone in 1996 on an old manual typewriter. Number 11. Her publisher, Bloomsbury, was so worried that Deathly Hallows would leak, they gave the project the codename Edinburgh Potmakers to divert attention. Oh come on, they could have chosen something without pot in the title. Potterheads would have sniffed that out like a bogger in a chamber of secrets, for goodness sake. Number one to, I mean 12. Rowling originally wrote Harry's bezzy mate, Ron Weasley, as a character who swears a lot. However, the publisher told her to remove the bad language as it wouldn't be suitable for young audiences. I'm fucking warning you, Hermione. Keep that fucking beast of yours away from Scabbers or I'll fucking turn it into a tea cosy. The shit. Number 13. Ah, oh, JK Rowling often found herself short of paper when inspiration came to her. <laughs> we've all been there. Oh, you mean writing paper. She wrote her initial ideas for the book down on a napkin, and the name of the Hogwarts houses were concocted on the back of a sick bag. Unused, I hope. Number 14. King of Pop, Michael <laughs> Jackson, once moonwalked his way to Rowling to ask to make a musical of the books, but she thought the idea was bad. <laughs> Get it? Bad. Number 15. However, a play of Harry's life after Hogwarts is hitting the stage in London in 2016. No doubt we'll see him grapple with student loan debt, midlife crises, and what day to put the bins out. It's gonna be thrilling. Number 16. Like the three lead characters, JK Rowling's parents met on a train from King's Cross Station. Maybe that too was heading to Hogwarts. Who knows? Number 17. Nicholas Flamel, the wizard and alchemist who discovered the Philosopher's Stone, was actually a real person. 
The real Flamel lived in Paris in the 1300s and was rumoured to be an alchemist who discovered a mythical stone that would turn lead into gold. Number 18. In the Hogwarts school exams, instead of receiving the grade fail, students receive the grade troll. You get the same grade if you fail to be a decent member of the online community too, apparently. Hey, by the way, is there one in the dungeon? Turn the roll in the dungeon! Oh, okay, thanks, Quirrell. Number 19. Rowling stated she always intended for the T of Voldemort to be silent to make it sound all French and stuff, as in Voldemort, but it never came across in the books properly. Number 20. Voldemort's wand is made of you. No, no, not. Not you, you, as in the word, Y-E-W, you. You was seen by some as having a great supernatural power and being a symbol for death and rebirth, which reflects Voldemort's desire for immortality. Number 21. Rowling invented Quidditch after a fight with her ex-boyfriend. She said that she needed to invent a sport and the importance of the snitch in the game tends to infuriate men. So the two came together quite nicely in the end. Number 22. The Dementor's Kiss, known for quite literally sucking the life and joy out of people, represents the depression that JK suffered at the time of writing. Number 23. Rowling has said she wasn't in a happy place when writing the middle of the series, and strongly considered bumping Ron off. That means kill him, by the way, not anything, you know. Number 24. In the Order of the Phoenix novel, the code to enter the Ministry of Magic from the street is 62442. If you borrow the nearest person over 50 and grab their old school mobile phone, 62442 spells out magic. Whoa, 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 it's magic. It, you know, don't you even... Sorry, I'll stop. Number 25? Harry's parents, James and Lily, are soulmates because of the Patronus, the wispy white stuff that comes out the end of a wand. Oh, come on, grow up. The charm is a physical representation of one's soul. James's Patronus is a stag, and Lily's is a doe, meaning they are a perfect fit together, you know, soul-wise. I hear Jennifer Lawrence's Patronus is a puma, and mine is a weasel, and those two go together like chalk and cheese, right? Right? Number 26. In case you were wondering in your little head, Ron's Patronus is a Jack Russell Terrier doggy, and Hermione's is an otter. Number 27. J.K. Rowling made Potterhead spit out their snitch-shaped cereal everywhere when she said that she regrets Hermione and Ron ending up together, stating that Hermione and Harry would have been a much better fit. I know what she means. If they got married and bought personalised towels, they could really easily share them. Number 28. J.K. Rowling revealed that Dumbledore is, or was, tip of to the curb from her dead homie, gay, and was in love with a great wizard called Grindelwald. Number 29. If Dumbledore had a muggle song playing at his funeral, Rowling said it would be my way. You know, my way. That song by the Backstreet Boys? I want it. That, oh, that's that way. Sorry, I got it wrong. Number 30. Dumbledore is an old English word for bumblebee. Rowling stated she chose the name because she imagined Dumbledore strolling around the castle humming to himself. Although bees buzz, JK, not hum. I learned that in kindergarten. Come on now. Number 31. The name Voldemort comes from French words meaning fly from death. Number 32. Hagrid's first name Rubius is Latin for something produced from a bramble or a thicket, which is apt because Hagrid often looks like he's crawled out of a tramp's bush. I still love him though, look at that face. Number 33. Mors Modre is the spell that makes the dark mark appear and means take a bite out of death in French. A suitable command for death eaters, but dangerous and probably quite disgusting for literally everybody else. Number 34. Professor McGonagall's first name, Minerva, is named after the Greek goddess of wisdom and magic. So don't mess, yeah? Number 35. Hermione's name also has a mythological origin and means messenger, which is apt for her constant delivery of knowledge to others. I'm not an owl! Number 36. The Bella of Bellatrix the Strange may make you immediately think of the Italian translation for beautiful, however in Latin the word means battles, which is far more reflective of the death-eating, Russell Brand circa 2007 haired bitch. Yeah, that's right, bitch. I said it. I'm with Molly on this. Not my daughter, you bitch! <laughs> Number 37. The school motto is Draco Dormiens Numquam Titulandus, which means never tickle a sleeping dragon in Latin. Sound advice there, not least because that's Daenerys' job. Oh wait, wrong franchise. Number 38! 
Rowling has stated that the name Hogwarts may have been subconsciously inspired by the name of a plant that Rowling found in Kew Gardens in New York. Number 39. Expecto Patronum! Literally translates as I await a guardian in Latin. Number 40. The driver and conductor of the Magic Night Bus, which I'll eternally wait for at London bus stops for as long as I live, are called Ernie and Stanley, and are named after JK Rowling's grandfathers. Number 41? Because you have to be in at least one Harry Potter film to be considered a British actor, many of the cast are connected and related. For instance, the actor who played the 11-year-old Tom Riddle was actually the nephew of Ray Fiennes, who plays Voldemort. It's almost like they're playing the, uh, same person. Hmm? The meaning of life. Bill Weasley is played by Donald Gleeson, the son of Brendan Gleeson, the actor who plays Mad-Eye Moody. And Barty Crouch Jr., sort of. Number 43. In the final scene of the final film, Draco Malfoy's wife Astoria Greengrass was played by Tom Felton's real-life girlfriend Jade Olivia, who I really hope isn't related to him in any way. Number 44. Emma Watson had only been in school plays before winning the part of Hermione. She was picked when the casting team visited her school looking for potential child actors. They must have missed my school because they never came to me. I would have been a perfect Hermione. <laughs> Number 45. Emma Watson and Hermione not only share the same face, but they also share the fact that they are both extremely intelligent. After filming Harry Potter, she went to an Ivy League university in America and did a year at Oxford University. Number 46. Daniel Radcliffe was in the bath when he found out he got the part of Harry and subsequently cried. Not because he was in the bath and hated his own naked body, but because he got the part, I imagine. Not that I imagine Daniel Radcliffe in the bath. Let's move on, let's move on. Number 47. When he first auditioned for the role of Ron, Rupert Grint sent an audition tape of him dressed as a lady and rapping the lyrics, Hello, my name is Rupert Grint. I hope you don't think I stink. Which, which, which doesn't rhyme, but it seemed to have worked. Number 48. Tom Felton originally auditioned for both Harry Potter and Ron Weasley, but the casting team thought he'd be more suited for Draco. Which is a bit insulting, really, but hey, he probably got over it and didn't need years of therapy. Number 49. Alan Rickman, who played Snape, was the only actor to know the final fate of their character before the final books were released. Rowling told Rickman that Snape had always loved Lily Potter, so he could play the part more accurately. Number 50! The series was nominated for a total of 12 Oscars, but Chamber of Secrets and Order of the Phoenix did not receive any nominations from the Academy at all. Number 50, Oon. Due to the young cast in the first few films, there was a dentist on standby for the cast in order to replace any teeth that the actors may have lost during filming. Dentus Reparo. Number 50, duh. Harry's eyes in the films weren't the vivid green described in the books because Daniel Radcliffe's eyes reacted badly to the contact lenses. I don't get it, why didn't they just colour in his eyes with felt-tip pen? That's what I used to do. Number 50, twa. The three lead actors were banned from playing any contact sports at all, in case they injured themselves and delayed filming time. Number 50, Catra. There were over 1,000 bottles in the potion classroom. Each was labelled and filled with something different, even though they were so small you couldn't see them on the screen. Number 50, Sank. Most of the books in Dumbledore's office were phone books that had been rebound and covered in dust. So he can look up the name of the spell and get the name of a dodgy Chinese restaurant that closed in 1997. Number 50, Cease. Daniel Radcliffe broke 80 wands during the filming of the entire series because he had a habit of using them as drumsticks. What film did he think he was in? Whiplash? Number 50, Set. Harry's scar was applied to Radcliffe's face over 2,000 times during the filming of the entire series. He could have just easily got it as a tattoo and saved everybody a lot of time, surely. Number 50, Huit. Bum casts were made for the seats mounted on the brooms to make them more comfortable during filming. Oof, getting those done must have been an awkward appointment. Number 50, Nerf. To prevent spoilers being released to the public like some sort of contagious virus, fake names were used for the movies. Goblet Fire was known as Happy Days, and Order of the Phoenix was known as Tip Top. Number 60. Boarding School Harrow School was the only real school used for filming Hogwarts scenes. The rest were filmed in universities, castles, your deepest darkest nightmares, and cathedrals across the United Kingdom. Number 61. Both Rosie O'Donnell and Robin Williams both asked for roles without any pay. However, they were unable to due to the strict conditions from J.K. Rowling that all the cast must be British or Irish. Number 62. Like a cheeky little rebellious schoolboy, 
Dumbledore actor Michael Gambon, while filming, often wore normal clothes under his Dumbledore robes and put a pack of cigarettes in his sock. Number 63. Robbie Coltrane, who plays Hagrid, once got a fruit bat and a mini fan stuck in his shaggy beard, which had to be cut out with scissors. And I thought the Cheeto dust I got caught in my moustache that one time was rough. Nintendo, I mean number 64. In order to make things more realistic in the Philosopher's Stone, in the scenes in which children are seen doing schoolwork, the child actors are doing their actual schoolwork from actual real life school. Number 65. Emma Watson often brought her pet hamster Millie on the set of the Philosopher's Stone. When the hamster eventually died, set decorators built a tiny coffin with velvet lining and a silver plaque with Millie's name engraved on it. R.I.P. Millie. She's on the big hamster wheel in the sky now. Number 66. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa. Number 67. John Williams provided the score for both Harry Potter and Star Wars in 2002, which may be why some of the music used in the Quidditch match in the Chamber of Secrets was also used during the speed of chase scene in Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Number 68. To get a more realistic movement of the floating knitting needles in the Chamber of Secrets, a crew member filmed his mother knitting for several hours. Can you imagine something more tedious than that? Watching this video! Oi! Who said that? Number 69. A picture of Middle-earthian magician extraordinaire Gandalf from The Lord of the Rings can be seen in the collection of great wizards in Professor Dumbledore's study in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Only eagle eyes can spot it though. That is, you know, unless they're busy deciding whether or not to save Frodo. Number 70. During the filming of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, an outbreak of head lice hit the children in the cast. Well, okay, not, not literally hit, I mean. Number 71. Moaning Myrtle may look like a wispy blue schoolgirl, but the actor who played her, Shirley Henderson, was 37 when she appeared in the Chamber of Secrets. Number 72. To gain a deeper understanding of their roles, the director of Prison of Azkaban, Alfonso Cuaron, made the three lead actors write essays on their characters. In true Hermione fashion, Emma Watson wrote a 16-page essay. Boffin! I bet Rupert Grint did copy and pasted the word Ron 16,000 times. Number 73. Alfonso told the visual effects team that he would like the rain to turn to ice when the Dementors appear. However, due to his thick Mexican accent, which, don't worry, I'm not going to attempt, they mistook ice for eyes, and therefore a storyboard with eyes falling from the sky was presented to Alfonso, much to his surprise. Number 74. Quaron recommended to Daniel Radcliffe that he pretended he was looking at Cameron Diaz in a G-string when he had to act awkwardly. If he wanted him to be sick or cry, he'd probably make him watch Cameron Diaz in sex tape. Number 75. In Prison of Azkaban, in the scene where students are sleeping in the Great Hall, the director and Snape actor Alan Rickman played a prank on Daniel Radcliffe with a remote-controlled whoopee cushion. Lol. It sounds like you've expelled rectal gas, Mr. Potter. Oof, that was a bad Snape. That was... that was bad, I'm sorry. Number 76. The Prisoner of Azkaban is the only film to not feature Voldemort in any form. In the Harry Potter series, that is, not just in general. It's not like Voldemort appears in Schindler's List or something. Number 77. Tom Felton's Hogwarts robes had their pockets sewn shut because he kept trying to sneak food onto the set. God, what is it with this cast and sneaking stuff onto set? Number 78. Ian Brown, lead mumbler of the Stone Roses, made a celebrity cameo in the movies. He appears as a Leaky Cauldron customer in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Number 79. Victor Crumb, no relation to Salacious Crumb, only has two lines in the Goblet of Fire, equating to 20 words. Quality, not quantity though, or at least that's what I'm reassured. Number 8T. In the Goblet of Fire, when the champions are entering the arena for the third task, the students from Beau Baton are dancing the Macarena. It seems Michael Cheese Pop is a big niche genre in the French magic world. Their victory song is Aga Doo Doo Doo. Push pineapple, shake the tree. Number 8111. A tank that holds half a million gallons of water was built to film the underwater scenes. Hey, there's a big bit of water that you could have used for free called the sea. Pfft, silly filmmakers. Number 82. Daniel Radcliffe alone logged 41 hours and 38 minutes in total filming in the underwater tank. Did he even take a breath? Is he part fish? The conspiracy starts here. Number 83. Young Icelandic viewers apparently laughed their Icelandic heads off when Rita Skeeter was first introduced. The word Skeeter in Icelandic translates to the word meaning, uh, defecating. Fitting, really. As many of us know, Rita's writing is a right load of sh**. 
I mean, sorry, I mean Skeeter. Skeeter. Right load of Skeeter. Number 84. Alan Rickman banned Rupert Grint and Matthew Lewis from being anywhere near his new BMW when filming Order of the Phoenix, as they spilled their milkshakes in his old car during the Goblet of Fire. Fiat Peterman! In the Order of the Phoenix, during the breakfast scene in the Great Hall, boxes of cereal can be seen with the name Cheery Owls and Pixie Puffs, with colour schemes similar to those of Cheerios and Sugar Puff boxes. They're also drinking milk straight from a Dementor's teat. <laughs> kidding. But wh where do they get the milk from? Number 86. The Order of the Phoenix was originally an arse hurting three hours long, and 45 minutes of it had to be trimmed out. Number 87. Are you ready for an oh? Because it's coming. Over 40 kittens were brought in for a kitten photo shoot to be featured on the dishes of Umbridge's office. They were all adopted after filming. Oh, told you there it was. Number 88. Because you know deep down you deserve to be punished. <sighs> Umbridge is the biggest bitch ever. Number 89. For the Half-Blood Prince, a third of the set of the Barrow was built, only to be burned down again for the big burning fire scene. It took 14 weeks to build and 6 minutes to burn down. Number 90! The Half-Blood Prince is Daniel Radcliffe's least favourite Harry Potter movie because he hates his own performance in it. Oh, Danny boy, you were perfectly fine. I'm sure you had lots of dollars to wipe your eyes with. Number 91! Now. If you two don't mind, I'm going to bed before either of you come up with another clever idea to get us killed. Or worse, expelled. Okay, so this isn't from the Half-Blood Prince, but it's always worth reminding yourself it's worse to be expelled than killed, guys. Number 92! This scene outside the cave where the Horcrux is kept was shot in the cliffs of Moa in West Ireland, and is the only scene to be shot outside the UK. Number 93! This is what it's like to force me to do vodka shots. Number 94. Over 2 million coins were made for scenes in Gringotts Bank for the final two films alone, and their legal tender in some shops in London. Okay, that last bit isn't true, but I'd, I'd love to see you try. Number 95. Jamie Campbell Boa, who plays Grindelwald, accidentally broke his ankle while jumping out the window after stealing the Elder Wand. Luckily, there was some Skelligra around. Woo! Number 96. In the Deathly Hallows Part 1, the Seven Harrys One Cup scene was so complicated that it took over 90 tanks to perfect. Number 97. In a reality mashing mind F, one of the posters in the London cafe that Harry, Ron and Hermione apparate into is for Daniel Radcliffe's play Equus. Number 98. During the rehearsals of the Deathly Hallows, Daniel Radcliffe's stunt double David Holmes was flung against a wall by an explosion and broke his neck. He's still alive, but unfortunately now he is paralysed from the waist down. Number 99. Jamie Waylett, who played Crab in the films, was cut from the cast for the final two movies after he was arrested for possession of cocaine. He was then sent to prison for his participation in the 2011 London riots. <sighs> Classic Slytherin right there. Number 100! The scene of Voldemort at Dumbledore's grave at the beginning of Deathly Hallows Part 2 made history. It was apparently the first time a scene had played before a studio's logo in a studio-based Hollywood film in over 75 years. Number 101! Deathly Hallows Part 2 is the only film in the series where Harry doesn't deliver the final line. His son Albus instead finishes the film and the series by saying, ready when he's about to board the Hogwarts Express. And there wasn't a dry eye in the bloody house. Oh, that's my childhood gone. That was 101 facts about Harry Potter. And I don't know about you, but I had a lovely time. If you want 101 episodes more than a house elf craves the sweet aroma of a sock, then click on subscribe right now and they'll apparate before your very eyes when they're ready. Or if you haven't yet had your fill of British actors titting about with magic and dragons, then why not head on over to Trend Crave's 10 Things You Didn't Know About Game of Thrones. You'll also have a lovely time there too, I'm sure. Oh, Harry Potter. The thing that made me eagerly await by my letterbox for a Hogwarts letter more enthusiastically than a dog without a social life. Wait, do dogs have social lives? They talk to each other. Well, you know, they, they bark. And, you know, they sniff stuff. Is that social? I mean, obviously not by our standards. You could get, you know, arrested for doing that. Not barking, the other sniffing thing. But they, I mean, dogs kind of communicate, right? Hmm. I'm going to go spy on a cocker spaniel for a bit. Mischief managed.